बच्चा असा के हर चीज इदारे वारन दिन या अल्लाह असा उन के वधाई दो के दिन आता हर चीज रनी तो असा के Good evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's 8.30 across the United Kingdom and we're coming to you live from the studios of British Muslim TV Centre here in Wakefield with this week's edition of Questions with me, your host, Mohamed Shafiq. We're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at the handle British Muslim TV. Wherever you are, joining us from around the world, a very warm welcome. Now, we want you to comment on the big stories we're covering tonight. Call us now on 01924 Two three one zero eight three. Your messages on the WhatsApp number, which is on the screen now. And if you're watching this on Facebook, post your comment in the chat box, and we'll read some of them on air later. Now tonight, first we head to Oldham and talk to Nasib Abbas, the Nasheed artist and humanitarian, who is inspiring thousands around the world to restore faith in humanity. We then head to the West Midlands and talk to Abda Khan, the writer and author, um, about her father's fight in World War II in Burma and how it inspired her latest novel. And as Islamophobia Awareness Month comes to an end today, we head to Glasgow and talk to the regional manager of MEND, Lindsay Taylor, about how the month has been and her reflections. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us on 01924 231083 or message us on British Muslim TV across social media. Alternatively, send us that WhatsApp message, which is on the screen now. The questions we're considering tonight. How can we help the most needy around the world? How can we use the struggle of our forefathers to influence our lives today? And how can we eradicate Islamophobia? Please share your thoughts now on 01924 231083. Your messages on WhatsApp, post on social media. We'll read some of your comments throughout the program. Right, let's get started on the program. Now, my guest is an exceptional man and a great human being. In such a short time, he's excelled in his chosen field of nasheeds, and he's also used that platform and that fame that comes with that to make a difference to the needy people around the world. So the question one would ask is, how can you go from a bus driver in a working class area like Oldham to an international nasheed reciter who then raises millions for charity and is recognized around the world? Nasiba Bas was born and bred in Oldham. He was a bus driver since the age of 17, and he did this for 13 years. What an amazing amount of time and how much barakah there would be in his work. And with a deep love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, a talented voice, he reads nasheeds around the country. His is a powerful story, and I'm really excited and proud that we're having this conversation. First of all, I must declare an interest. He's a very good friend of mine. And he's a colleague and somebody I greatly admire and respect. And I've seen him grown um, into this amazing personality. And he hasn't lost his ability to be humble. Uh, and that's why we love him so much. I'm pleased to say Naseeb Abbas is joining us live now from Oldham. Naseeb, uh, salam alaikum. A very warm welcome to the program. Oh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Shafiq bhai, how are you? I'm really, really good. It's an honor for British Muslim TV to have you on the program. Um, First of all, Shafiq, why it's an honor for me to be on your program, mashallah, and for British Muslim TV. And just for our viewers' sake, we've been trying to get this uh, in your schedule. You're very, very busy, man. So we, we are very, very grateful. We finally get there. Anyway, um, Naseeb, let's start at the beginning. You were born and bred in Oldham. Tell us a bit about your childhood and your upbringing. Um, so alhamdulillah, we've, uh, obviously, it's, I will also say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very humble upbringing, alhamdulillah. Uh, we don't live in one of the most posh settings, one of the, one of the most... You're from uh, Godic. Richard Glory, yes, one of the, one of the richest areas is basically where the riots took place, literally on my doorstep. I, I actually watched the riots from my window when they did take place all those years ago. Uh, but alhamdulillah, you know, ever since from then onwards, you know, uh, my my place where I live, alhamdulillah, has been, you know, it's been progressing uh, towards towards the good. And alhamdulillah, we've we've achieved what we've achieved, mashallah. And it's always an honor that you know, whenever wherever I go in the world, whenever I go in the country, I always say I'm from Oldham, I'm from Glory, you know, because there was once there was this 
there was this label on people who used to live in Oldham uh, that, you know, or, or the one, and they used to say, one, those are places where the riots took place. And I want you to change that, Shafiq. And Alhamdulillah, you know, through the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and good friends like yourself, you know, who have supported me and helped me. I know we've achieved what we've achieved and we've helped millions and millions of lives. And in fact, thousands of lives, mashallah, all around the world. And uh, it's always been an honor. It's a pleasure, mashallah. Yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about the charity work uh, later on in the program. But tell us, where did that passion come from for Nath and Nasheed? Uh, the Shafiq by the Naat and the Nasheed, um, it's the same thing, by the way, for those who are watching the Naat and Nasheed. So, Naat, so we have a, we have a, we have Pakistani views, but we also have lots of people from Africa and that's Asia that's and that's lots of English people, that. so that's why we use this. So, term Naat and Nasheed is exactly the same thing. Um, so alhamdulillah, I've always um, had a passion for Nasheeds, um, and my I think it started, it started off uh, with my mother. And as any everyone, you know, this the first school that you get taught is from the from your mother, mashallah. And I I, I feel as if my mother is the one who actually inspired me to be a Nath Khan, uh, because all her life she listened to Nasheeds, and whenever whenever even at the age of I don't know two three years old, ever ever since I I understood my surroundings and what was going around me, and all I could hear was the Nasheed of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's been instilled in me from a very very young age, mashallah. Yeah, and, and subhanAllah, Allah's given you a beautiful voice. If you haven't uh, heard Naseeb's uh, Nasheeds, you, you can watch on YouTube and uh, various platforms. How did you practice reading Naat? Because actually English is your first language. Urdu isn't your first language. And right. it, it can be difficult to understand pronunciations, get the right. How did you practice? Um, so when I, obviously, I, I had this passion, obviously, because I because I wanted to, uh, listen to Nats first, and then obviously I started reciting them after uh, about 10 years ago, I think it has been now, mashallah. So there was a time where, I don't know when, uh, back in the days, everyone used to have these uh, uh, these massive t uh, tape recorders, tape, tape players. Um, I can't remember what they, what they were called now. So I had one of those fixed in my room. And I remember every time I used to put a cassette inside it and just press play. And every time that cassette used to come to its end, it used to automatically like, do itself and then the, everything used to hi-fi system that's the one sorry yeah it's a hi-fi system so alhamdulillah i had, I had a hi-fi system from day one so i used to listen and recite so i used to so if i liked something i used to listen to it and then carry on listening to it and even going to bed i used to listen to it while i'm falling asleep and in the morning you know i'll play again so it was it was constantly around me nasheed were constantly around me the first thing i heard in the morning was a nasheed and the last thing i heard uh, before I went to sleep was the nasheed of the Prophet Sallallahu Yeah, that's really, really important. Now, you've become one of the UK's most prominent uh, Naat reciters. How do you reflect on your journey from the humble beginning to what you are now, where you can't go anywhere without people recognizing you? Alhamdulillah, uh, Shafiq Bhai. You know, I always say that um, for all of for our Urdu, uh, and I always say, I'm, I'm truly humbled. Uh, I don't consider myself as worthy uh, to be a, a prominent Nasheed artist. Uh, you know, there's many beautiful Sana Khani Rasuls up and down the country. Uh, but I believe, I think one thing is, you know, when you, when you give people love, you receive love back. And something which, uh, alhamdulillah, has been instilled in me from a very, very young age, that when you show love to people and you get love back, you know, that transaction in, its, in itself is a very beautiful transaction and it goes a very, very long way. Like the Prophet wasallam said, smiling is charity. Smiling is charity. It doesn't cost you to smile. But if you was to smile and you've not met someone, on many occasions people have met me, you know, on the on the streets, uh, when I'm abroad, when Dubai, Pakistan, wherever I've gone, and you meet them with a smile in your face and you have an interest in how they know, how they've recognized you and whatnot. And people enjoy that. People love that, uh, uh, Bai. And from, from, you know, from a very, very... Uh, Young age, mashallah. I think my my mum has always told me that always give respect, uh, and you'll you'll receive respect back as well, mashallah. And how do you deal with this sort of negativity that you sometimes see on social media? You, as I said, you you've got a huge following on social media, and you often get attacked <laughs> publicly, as many of us do who are in the public eye. How do you handle that? Um, Shabik, I I have respect for negativity as well. Because, you know, when, when people, when you get negative comments, 
first of all, there's always room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. We're human beings. We make mistakes, alhamdulillah, and you rectify those mistakes. Now, when people give you those negative comments, I I, I classify those those negative people who actually have, well, some people call them haters, but I classify them as two uh, in two categories. One is people just don't like the way you are, the way you how, the way you portray yourself, and also the, the second category I I believe in is people have got like this false misconception about you they've got this false you know uh, information about you and they've built this character inside themselves for them to hate you now i've res- i've got respect for both people alhamdulillah and but i love to work with the with the one that has a misconception because once the once the once the person who has a misconception and knows about the truth it, it changes everything and on many many occasions Shafiq, by alhamdulillah you know we've got thousands and thousands of followers mashallah who love us and then there might be a fair few that don't like you and obviously they've been told a few things which have not been uh entirely true and for that reason alhamdulillah <coughs> i've you know we've rectified it we've spoken to them we've told them about the issues and mashallah it's changed their opinion and i've i've Shafiq, Shafiq, by believe it or not i've seen those people who once didn't like to follow our work who now donate towards our cause mashallah oh, alhamdulillah and the second the second category is human nature it is human nature unfortunately and you can't change that and i always say allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide me first and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them and it comes down to that alhamdulillah yeah and you know one of the things um i know about you is is that humbleness um and sincerity in, <coughs> in what in what you do we've got about 90 seconds to the break and i just wanted to Reflect on that. I mean, you, mashallah, um, are making a real difference in communities uh, around the country. How important is it for you to be a positive role model for those youngsters and, and children who listen to you? Shabibah, that's a very beautiful question. We live in a, in a technological uh, world. Alhamdulillah, you know, technology is, a, is a, literally our hands, mashallah. And if you become positive and you've got a thousand people watching your positivity, you've automatically... In, you've increased that positivity by a thousand times and i believe okay, if you can provide that one goodness that good one head onto the social media world and people have reenacted that and they put that in their own world mashallah the world's a better place to live alhamdulillah yeah well naseeb i know you're going to stay with us we need to take a very quick break when we come back we'll continue the important conversation uh, with one of the UK's most prominent Nasheed uh, reciters, Naseeb Abbas, known as Prince Naseeb Abbas. Uh, we'll talk about his charity humanitarian work. And did he know he's raised over £3 million for the most needy people uh, in the world? Don't be going anywhere. If you've got any questions, please do send them on social media. Uh, the handle is British Muslim TV. Or call us, even better, on 01924 uh, We'll take that break. We'll be very back. We will, we will be back very shortly. Don't go anywhere. as alaikum. असांते मिया वसे डाडा असां डाडो परेशान थिया से असांते बोड अची वई घर को बेघर थिया से असां जो जायु किरी पयो कुछ न रहे ओ असां जो सखणा सिर वठी असां निकता हु त बच्चा असां जा मजूरी कंदान त खाइंदा हु जे न कंदान त असां कदी चुलो भी न बारिंदा हु असां सा ये मजबूरी हु न ओ हित बैठा हु अची खीमा देना त खीमन में बैठा हु असां के अटो मिलयो खाने जो सजो ही राशन मिलयो जो अस खाई जैमें हर शे मौजूद है उनमें थाव भी किचन जहा सजाई अस दिना अव अस भाइर की मेहरबानी आ उनमें बाल्टू हैं बदना भला इन भाइर के अना गंज ईद अस मदद कह إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه. رسول الله حبيب الله. What does it mean to follow the Prophet peace be upon him? رسول الله رسول الله. Be content with that which you have been given. You will be the richest of people. رسول الله.
find your perfect match. Join 3 million members worldwide. Download the singlemuslim.com app for free now. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq, uh, live from our studios here at the British Muslim TV Centre in Wakefield. Um, we are having a really important conversation uh, with the Nasheed artist, uh, Prince Nasib Abbas is here. And he's not just an ordinary Nasheed artist, he's also a humanitarian. Uh, Nasib, you've raised millions for charities. The last time I looked, you were about... Three million, I think. I, I'm sure that you must have ex exceeded that. Um, uh, tell, tell us about the charity work. We're on four million at the wow. moment. Alhamdulillah, we're on four million. Subhanallah, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, I mean, yeah. I, as somebody who does lots of humanitarian work myself and lots of TV appeals, um, it, it's the most rewarding work to do. How, That's how, how did you get into it, and, and how did you, you know, how did you get involved? It's, that's a very beautiful story, uh, Shafiq Bai. And I remember when. ITV come to my house because um, Alhamdulillah I've, I got nominated for the Pride of Britain Awards in the UK as well I come second in the country um, so Alhamdulillah that, that got recognised I remember ITV um, Zoe she's called the presenter and she asked me the same question she goes you know how did you get into charity work and I want to told her this and how you know how it started off from one little phone call uh, to what it is today and how that one phone call changed everything you know she was she was really inspired by the story uh, so I, w I obviously want to share it to all our British Muslim TV followers as well and watchers that alhamdulillah you know, it started off with practically literally one phone call and it was a phone call from my very good friend uh, Sheikh Ustad Adam Kelvig which uh, Sheikh Pai you know them very very well as well mashallah yeah, yeah. very humble individual mashallah who's also very uh, prominent is very um, hard working in the charity world, mashallah. He's helped millions around the world, mashallah. He's my inspiration. Uh, he's the, he's the brother that you know that brought me into this field, mashallah. And I remember that phone call that come out of the blue, and I, I was sat at home with family, and the phone call come to me. And at this point, I know, alhamdulillah, I had my followers through my social media nasheeds, and people loved to listen to the nasheeds, so people carried on following us. And then he contacted me. He goes, Nasib, you know, how about we change? your your following instead of them watching you and listening to you let's them let's get them to take it one step further and i just said what's that you go let's let's get them to uh to donate towards a very good cause and i'm like Ustad, how is this going to happen like you know watching someone and then giving money is is two different things like you know you know money giving money is it's is very hard for anyone to do you know money is something which we need everyone needs in the day day in day out and i said to my girl, how are we going to achieve this and after when i heard his plan his story and how we're gonna achieve you know, in making sure that we can help thousands of people around the world, especially the first ever event uh, place I went to was Jordan, the Syrian refugees. And I was very passionate about the Syrian refugees because I was watching, you know, so many um, atrocities that were taking place for our Syrian brothers and sisters on social media. And there was a part of me that from my heart, I made a dua go, Ya Allah, you know, give me the himmat and the tawfi, give me the ability to be able to help my brothers and sisters rather than just going onto social media and writing a comment saying that this is sad. And maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heard that dua because the dua came from the heart and, and it came in the form of Ustav Adam Kelvi and we headed towards the borders of Syria and we were, went to Jordan, mashallah, and I remember staying there. Now. The first ever appeal that we launched, mashallah, I raised 45,000 pounds, which for me was a phenomenal amount. I, I could not have even thought of that I was going to raise that much money and the reason why we raised that much money is because we showed people where the money was going yeah. we showed people that we weren't living in you know luxurious houses we weren't going in private jets to you know this you know just to help others we, we showed people that these are our humble uh, beginnings this is how we are going to help our brothers and sisters this is where your money is going mashallah and for that you know people you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, David Cameron, once I, I, the prime, ex-Prime Minister of this country, quoted that the biggest, most generous givers in the United mm. Kingdom are Muslims. Yeah, that's and, so true. Uh, you know, our, Alhamdulillah, they never yeah. fail. 
our Muslim brothers never fail, mashallah. Yeah, and, and consistently the Treasury, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury, have said consistently the Muslim, British Muslim community give more in charity than any other community, and that's consistent. Wow. Um, I, I know that when I went to Gaza in 2013, um, even before you did the charity work, uh, we did some fundraising. Do you remember? Um, and, um, you know, it was a considerable amount of money that you helped. Um, yeah. It was amazing. And, and to be able to go to tents and to be able to talk to those communities and to meet them and to help them, I mean, that's just priceless, isn't it? It is. It is. You know, listening to the story, Shafiq Bhai, um, you know, watching, you know, how they live, first of all, and the conditions that they were living in uh, is truly, you know, it brings you down to earth, Shafiq Bhai. It drinks, you know, we take the life granted in the UK. We take it as granted thinking that we, you know, we were born with this. But, you know, we should be very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've been put in this. You know, we've got security. One of the most biggest blessings that people do not understand is security you know having living in your safe house you know not thinking that you know in the morning are we going to wake up is our house going to be blown up by a missile these people were living in that fear and you know we listened to their stories firsthand and they were truly touching very very emotional and i remember on many occasions i i decided not to go into the houses because i have a very soft uh, heart for listening to these stories and it, it gets to me. Honestly, it gets to me. And on many occasions, I said to Ustad Adam, look, you go in the house, make the video, show me the video, because I can't go in there and I can't listen to the story. Because when I listen to the stories, it doesn't let me sleep at night. You know, it, it, it's truly, you know, heart touching. And it, it really, and, and the only thing is, obviously, I take it back. And Alhamdulillah, you know, I, I kind of carry a thinking about it, you know, throughout for the next couple of days as well. And it does have an effect on you, doesn't it? Sorry? Yeah. It, I'm just saying it does have a massive effect on you. Um, and, it does. And, and, mentally, and having mentally that, has a very mass, a massive effect. And having, and having that resilience is really, really important. Now, uh, Court is Kashmir Orphan Relief uh, Organization, which is set up by Joe Akhtar. Yeah. Uh, it's a yeah. fantastic. Uh, I've been honored to have been there and, you know, done a TV appeal for them. Arch, tell us a bit about Court and how, how did you get involved in supporting them? Alhamdulillah, Court, I, I'm going to say, is probably one of the best charities I've I've worked for, Alhamdulillah. It's probably the one of the most... Uh, it's, it's the sort of charity I feel like I'm at home, Alhamdulillah. And I feel like I'm I'm pretty much helping. You know what they said? When charity starts at home, this is the beginning of my that journey. Charity starts at home. The Shmeed Orphan Relief Trust, Alhamdulillah, have been about since the uh, since 2008. Now, the reason why I remember this is the day the uh, earthquake struck in Muzaffarabad in Pakistan in 2008 or 2005. Sorry, it's one five, of those yeah, years. Five, yeah. 2005 was it, Mushafi? Yes, 2008. Five, five. Five. That's yeah. right. My granddad passed away on the same day. It was the month of Ramadan. Yeah. And I remember, you know, there was a chaos, you know, within the hospital. And then when we went out of the hospital, there was, you know, we were hearing news that there's a huge earthquake that struck place in Pakistan. And that's where the beginning of uh, court, you know, alhamdulillah, that's where they they, sh they started shining, mashallah. And they've, they've gone out and they've done what they've done, mashallah. And they've progressed from there, from giving humanitarian aid out to opening one of the biggest, largest orphanages in Southeast Asia, mashallah. And many people have been there, Shabiq Bhai, you've been there yourself, mashallah, and it's got the wow factor. Because it, it doesn't look like an orphanage. No, it it looks like a five-star hotel, alhamdulillah. Yeah. And we don't call it an orphanage, we call it an educational complex, mashallah, where we have children um, who came, and came in as orphans are now leaving with degrees uh, in engineering, mashallah, pharmacies, uh, pharmaceutical, mashallah. They're working in the pharmaceutical in uh, uh, in the in the world, mashallah. They've got uh, our children working in Dubai. We've got children working in Islamabad. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, they've progressed from from giving humanitarian aid uh, to bringing orphans and then giving those orphans a house, a home, giving them a you know a chance to uh, that they've got opportunities. You know, when when we come to the UK and Europe, we say that this is a land of opportunity. And how amazing is it that that one building is achieving what people have come to the UK for, mashallah. Wow. That is giving them the opportunity, mashallah. And mashallah, our, our children are thriving. Uh, and you've met them first time as well, Shavik Bhai. You've listened to their stories. And, you know, you when you meet those children, do they look like orphans to you? No, they do don't. Do they feel like orphans to you? No. They've totally forgot about their, their ordeal. They forgot about what they've, what they've been through. 
they're looking towards a positive way now, mashallah, which is uh, Kashmir Orphan Relief Trust's uh, help and support for them uh, for a brighter future, inshallah. Yeah, well, I'm really looking forward uh, to the day when we can talk to Shodhi Akhtar, the founder of Chai. We've got three minutes left, and I just wanted to finish uh, on a couple of questions. One, uh, something that you've done really important. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but you were one of the first people to bring the concept of nasheed into our weddings so that we're, we're a lot more Islamic and aware of yes. our Islamic upbringing. Um, and you've thrived on that scene, if you like, in the wedding scene. Tell us why it's important for you to do that. Um, she think why we needed a change. We needed a change uh, from a cultural perspective and from an Islamic perspective. We needed a change within our weddings. There was too much going on in our weddings, which uh, which had nothing to do with our religion, which which were uh, you know traditions of past other religions. And obviously, I can understand where it's come from because Pakistan and India were once together as well, and you know those kind of uh, traditions have come from India. And so people were using a lot of stuff which were uh, which weren't very. Um, I would say Islamically friendly, uh, and Alhamdulillah, we we bought into this, this new concept of being able to provide a service. Uh, mashallah, for those who uh, follow me, you know, we do we, we provide a halal I like it, halal DJ, DJ itself has you know it's got a different concept, but we wanted to turn that and turn that into a halal DJ. So and because of that, Mashallah, it's it's, it's been so successful. And it's and I'm 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 not even joking, this Shafiq, but I'm so busy. Uh, like I've not got even time to even like um, decide as to where I need to go. Because Alhamdulillah, is people have loved the concept, people have enjoyed yeah. the concept, and people just love to hear the the praises of the Prophet so And when when everyone in the community, everyone in the hall, when there's a thousand people reading the Rushri, that in itself it brings blessings, mashallah. Yeah, and and you know, let me say this to you: you were one of the first to do it, so you get the sadaqa yeah, jaya, you'll get the reward for all the other people who are doing it as well. Look, final question: what what does the future hold? What can we expect from you in the future? The future for me, uh, Shafiq Bhai, uh, and I said this to ITV as well. Okay, Alhamdulillah, I'm my my goal is to serve my people, the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the very end. And if I believe, okay, if I, 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 my, my will is, my wish is that may my, my final uh, end be in this game, Alhamdulillah, <coughs> which is serving the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thank you. Umar, the Prophet, and Alhamdulillah, and, and it's in itself, you know, wherever it takes me, Shafiq Bhai, you know, I always say, okay, Allah, give us a tawfiq to be grounded, as always. I mean, And just as it is. Take well, it as it comes, mashallah. Thank you so much. I could listen to you all night. I'm sure I can. But thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. We wish you well. Uh, love to the family as well. Thank you, Shabib Bhai. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, that was the uh, Nasheed reciter and humanitarian Naseeba Bas. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk to the author and novelist Abda Khan will be joining us on the side of this. Find your perfect match. Join 3 million members worldwide. Download the singlemuslim.com app for free now. असांते मिया वसा डाडा असां डाडो परेशान थिया से असांते बोड अची वई घर खो बेघर थिया से असां जो जायु किरी पयो कुछ न रहे ओ असां जो सखणा सिर वठी असां निकता हो त बच्चा असां जा मजूरी कंदा त खाइंदा हो जे न कंदा त असां कदी चुलो भी न बारिंदा हो असां सा ये मजबूरी हो न ओ हित बैठा हो जे खीमा देना त खीमन में बैठा हो असां के अटो मिलयो खाने जो सजो ही राशन मिलयो जो अस खाई जैमें हर शे मौजूद आए उन में थाव भी किचन जहा सजाई अस दिना अव 
असाने भाईरन जी मेहरबानी आ उन्हें में बाल्टियों ने बदना है ने अलाव ने भाईरन के अन्य गंजली दो असाने ही मदद तकन्दा Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios here in Wakefield. Now, we're taking your calls on 01924-231-083. Let me put my teeth back in. Uh, get in touch with us on social media. The handle is British Muslim TV. Let's move on to our next story and guest. Now, only this month, on the 11th of November, the country stopped and remembered the fallen in both world wars. Something that is often forgotten is the contribution of those from the Commonwealth, from Africa, from Asia, uh, hundreds of thousands came to fight alongside the British and many of them lost their lives defending our freedom so that we can live the way we can today. But what is their story and what lessons can we learn from their lives and apply that to our lives and the lives of our children? Now, Abda Khan is a solicitor by profession. She's written a number of books and is in the process of doing a novel based on the experience of her father. I'm pleased to say Abda Khan is joining us to reflect on her story and the story of her father. Uh, Abda, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Great to have you. Now, come on, let's start at the beginning. Tell us, when did you first learn about your father and what he did in World War II? Well, I kind of grew up always kind of knowing in the background that he had fought in the war, but I didn't really know much about it until I was about 11 years old. And I remember I couldn't sleep and I came down. And he said, what are you doing up? You should be in bed, shouldn't you? And I said, oh, Dad, I can't sleep. What, tell me something about your life, you know. And then he started telling me about his life in the early years, you know, where he was born and how he started working when he was only, I think he must have been about six years old or seven years old when he started working. And then he got on to telling me about, about the war. And it's, it's strange because he never really volunteered to tell any of us about the war. It's I used to pester him, actually. Uh, I'm kind of kind of glad I did now, to be honest, because, you know, um, he, I think that war was so brutal. It was quite hard for people who had fought in that war to talk about it. But um, like I said, he never did it unprompted. But if I if I kind of sat next to him and said, oh, dad, tell me about the war, tell me another story, he would actually then sort of indulge me a little bit. So that's where my interest really started um, a long time ago, really, I, I suppose you could say. Yeah. What was he what was he like, your dad? Oh my God, he's probably the last person you'd ever expect to have fought in, in World War II. So my dad was really, um, um, he was a very calm person. He was very, very non-confrontational. Um, he, he wasn't a particularly big man. Um, he was um, very gentle by nature. So now that I've been researching Burma and World War II, I realized exactly what he had to contend with. And I, I knew some of the stories. I think as a child, your child's perspective is very different. You know, as a child, I was more interested in other details uh, rather than the brutalities of the war. So um, my dad was just my dad. I suppose that's how I will remember him. Um, he, he was just not somebody you would automatically think had fought in such awful conditions and in such awful circumstances. Yeah, and you, you kind of said that he it was something which they didn't have a choice in the matter, you know, colonial Britain, uh, order yeah, goes I mean, out it, it, to the country. Yeah, it, was a, it was a volunteer army, so it wasn't, um, it wasn't conscription. So, so the, the story is, so my dad was quite young, um, and like I said, he was working. And one day he went into, um, my dad's from Gujarat, and um, he went into the, the share and he said he saw that there was a lot of commotion going on. He asked what was going on. And he was told that the British were recruiting. And he was only about 14 or 15 at the time. So um, without even thinking about it, he just got in the line and decided to enrol himself. Um, he lied about his age, obviously. He said he was 16. He wasn't 16. Uh, and I said, why did you do that, Dad? And he said, well, to pull my family out of poverty because his father was very ill. He, his father couldn't work. Um, he had really chronic asthma. Um, that's my dad, my granddad. And um, it was all on his shoulders, really, being the oldest son um, and having younger siblings. So I think he, it was very difficult for him to sort of help his mom to make ends meet. 
So for him, it was an economic decision. Um, it wasn't really, he was too young to understand the politics fully, I think. I mean, as a teenager, you don't really understand the intricacies of, um, you know, what's going on at the time. But it, it was quite a turbulent time, you know, because we had rumblings of um, partition going, we had the war going on, we had the possibility of J uh, Japan invading India. Of course, it wasn't, there was no Pakistan, then it was all India. So I suppose they didn't want to swap one enemy for another. You know, they had a colonial rule, and it might seem strange that he went and fought alongside the very power that was, you know, ruling over them. But at the same time, I don't think anybody particularly wanted Japan to come and invade India either. So I think there was a whole host of decisions why he, he went and joined, but I think the primary decision was um, a financial one. Yeah, and what was it? I mean, I'm sure you would have talked to him about what was the reaction from... Your dada, his granddad, and the rest of the family. Well, it was his mom's reaction. I think that was a, that was that I always remember because I, I said, "Oh, you, you went and did this," and then then what happened? He said, "Oh, I was walking home, and then suddenly I felt scared." And I said, "Well, why? Because you'd already joined the army, and you'd already get, had your medical and everything." He said, "Oh, because I realised when I got home, I'd have to tell your daddy, I'd have to tell your grandma <laughs> that I joined the army, and I knew she was going to be absolutely livid." And I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, she was. She was absolutely livid. And um, she she had a bite old go at me. And she said, why did you do that without asking me? And um, But he, I think he just explained to her that, you know, this, look, mom, this is a way for us to climb out of poverty. You know, we, d we don't have enough to eat. Um, you know, I mean, my, my dad's family, um, you're talking, he was born in the 1920s. So it's a long time ago. But he was definitely born into, like, severe poverty. And... Um, quite often they just didn't have any food to eat. It, it was that bad. So I think for him it was about, you know, I'll send you money and then you can buy some chickens and, you know, you can buy a goat and then we can have our own milk, then we can buy a cow. So he had, all, I mean, it was a lot of forethought considering his age of only 14 or 15. I feel as though there was a lot of thought gone into that snap decision of his. Yeah, that just random decision in the middle of a town centre thinking this is going to be my route out of poverty. But the yeah. small problem of fighting and potentially dying in a foreign country, that must have played on his mind as well. You know, I think, I don't know if, if it did so much because I think that generation were quite different. I think they'd, they'd, they were born into poverty. They were born into hardship. And for him, it was just about survival. I think since he was born, it was about survival, really. Um, there, you know, there was such a high infant mortality rate for a start. So, you know, even if you grew up and you survived, you know, life is still tough. I think, obviously, it, it must have been on his mind. And he, he did say to me that, you know, he saw so much death um, all around him, you know, just just bodies and bodies of, you know, dead soldiers. Um, and that was, you know, and he obviously lost a lot of his friends. that He, he made friends who he lost in the war. Um, but I think th that generation were very different, and his job was just to get on with it. And I don't think he really, you know, this is he, this is a teenager. He's never even he's never held a gun, he's never been in combat, he's never done anything apart from, you know, um, be at home in the village or you know used to carry sacks. That was his job in the warehouse. He used to carry sacks of rice and flour and things, and that's all he had ever done. So for him to go from that to fighting in a war, I think was just incredible. And I think sometimes you can't think too much about a decision like that, otherwise you won't do it, you know, in terms mm. of the consequences. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that generation was fearless to help get out of poverty, and that was their guiding principle. He was one of the fortunate ones. He lived, to, he survived. Um, what was like, life for him after the war? Um, well, he he actually, so he was part of the Punjab Regiment and he, obviously he was in Burma from 1942 to 1945 when, when the war ended. Um, and then, of course, he stayed in the army and then partition came in 1947. And his regiment um, it was transferred to Pakistan side. And he continued in the army, I think, for another about 10 years, I think. Um, and it's amazing because I, I found some of his old records and I, I'm, I've been doing a lot of research on this um, in order to write this book. And he, he, he received a, a, an amazing bravery medal, which he never told any of us about. 
um, he had been wounded twice and he still went and saved some of his comrades um, out in the battlefield. He risked life and limb, um, you know, and I, it's quite amazing that he actually never even mentioned any of that. And so, yeah, he stayed in the army, uh, Pakistani army for about 10 years and then he left in the 50s and then he came to England in about 1961. Yeah, he was part of that golden generation that arrived in the early 60s. My father came uh, in that generation as well in the 60s. Yeah. And as a result of being in the army, he was able to help pull his parents out of poverty. And that must have been an amazing feeling as well. Oh, definitely. Uh, and I think, you know, he managed to buy land. You know, they managed to buy land so they could grow their own crops, have their own animals. It it was such a big difference between, you know, what his existence had been like before. They weren't rich, but, you know, the fact is that they weren't, like, starving anymore. Uh, and I remember one of the one of my fondest memories of him is when um, uh, he told me when he got his very first job, he, was, he said he was about six or seven. Um, and he said he got a job, you know, like I said, carrying these sacks, um, the deliveries that used to come at the warehouse. And I said to him, what, you know, as a child, you're so curious about silly things, aren't you? I said, well, what did you get with your first pay, pay, pay packet? Um, he said, I went to the grocery store and I got my mom some um, patti and gur, tea leaves and jaggery. And, and that was just, for him, such an amazing thing to do because... They, they couldn't afford to do stuff like that. So, you know, to be earning, to, to have sent that money back home so his mum could actually, you know, become more self-sufficient and there's a family could become more self-sufficient, um, you know, and not have to uh, endure the kind of extreme poverty that they endured before was, was a massive difference for them. We've got about 90 seconds until we go to our break and I just wanted to ask you this. What are your reflections about do you think we as a country here in the UK are able to remember that generation of the Commonwealth who also contributed to fight no, side not, by side? No, I don't think I don't think we do enough. And I think the problem is that, that our own community doesn't really know enough about that generation that contributed to that war effort. And I think there's a few reasons for that. I think there's been this hesitancy on the part of India to um, recognise those soldiers immediately after the war because they were seen, some people saw them as traitors. Um, and then also our, you know, when our parents came here, those stories have kind of got lost, that that generation is virtually all gone. So I think it's really important for our, especially for our younger generation here to know the sacrifices that that generation made very quietly, very modestly and very, um, without any fuss over it, without any noise, but, you know, they helped give us a better, better life in the process. Yeah, thank you, Abdullah. It was a really powerful conversation, and this is why I really wanted to have it, because I think we don't often reflect on the contribution uh, of that golden generation who gives so much so that we could have a better life in this country um, and have the freedoms that we enjoy, um, and we're going to reflect on that. We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll continue the important conversation. Abda Khan, don't be going anywhere. We'll be back very shortly. my first trip to Pakistan when I was 12 that I saw kids my own age whose backs bowed under the weight of carrying water containers. It made me realise how fortunate I was. As I got older I became more involved to improve the plight of orphans in my home village. Eventually in 2009 I founded the charity Penny Appeal. Teamwork really does make the dream work because in a few years we became a British Muslim movement. Our donors saved lives, fed the homeless, built water wells, mosques, schools, hospitals. We innovated and took movies, comedy and music tours into our communities. By 2021 we impacted the lives of people across 56 countries and provided 49 million meals, alhamdulillah. It was the donors and the team that made Penny Peel surpass all my expectations. But it wasn't without struggles. Because I learned some lessons the hard way. So I hope you don't mind if I tell you the whole story of Penny Peel. Small change, big difference. 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Ask on WhatsApp any questions, any recommendations, any advice. We sometimes fall into the trap of the devil, of shaitan, and unfortunately lose our way. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. Now, we're reflecting on World War II veteran um, and that generation who made such a difference, uh, not just to their own families and getting them out of poverty, but actually to the Muslim story, to the Pakistani story, to the Asian story that we often sometimes forget. Um, and we're talking to the author and uh, novelist, Abda Khan, who's sharing her memories of her beloved father, uh, we, the lines are open, so if you do want to ask a question, uh, we're happy to take some calls now on 01924-231083. Now, Abdab, before the break, we were reflecting on the story of your father. Um, where did the idea of the novel come? Well, I have been writing novels for a few years now, but I've so far I've only written contemporary fiction. Mm. Um, and historical fiction is a whole other ball game. Um, so the thing is, I've been carrying my dad's stories around with you with me for a very long time. And I think as you get older, you reflect more on uh, some of the issues that start becoming more important to you. You think about your own mortality, you think about your own legacy, and then you think about your own parents a lot more as well. Um, and I thought to myself, I've got these stories of my dad, and there's not many from that generation left anymore. And I feel quite privileged, because the problem is those soldiers, most of them were illiterate. So Unlike the British soldiers who left diaries and letters and things, we have nothing, I have nothing tangible of my dad's um, in terms of um, letters, diaries, or anything like that. So the only thing I have is my conversations with him. So I decided that, you know, I would carry out research and I would write a novel. Inspire, I mean, it's not going to be completely about him, but it will be inspired by the stories that he told me. So, um, I've been researching for about over a year now, and I was lucky enough to get an Arts Council grant to carry out that research. So obviously there's there's been so much interest in this, and, um, you know, right from the Arts Council through to, you know, Channel 4, you, as you, I think you saw me on Channel 4, and that's how we got in touch with each other. Um, and, you know, people are very, very interested to know, actually, we've never heard of an Indian soldier's perspective on that war. Um, so I feel like I'm in a bit of a unique position to be able to actually do something a bit different. I've certainly never seen a novel from an Indian soldier's perspective before. Never, I don't think I've ever seen a film even um, in, you know, based in Burma in Second World War that's purely from an Indian soldier's perspective. I, I feel like I've been, I feel like I'm safeguarding those stories, but I feel like I need to do something with them. I feel like it's a bit of a legacy that is left with me and I need to pass it on because I think future generations do need to know as well what that generation, all the men, like my dad, there were two and a half million Indian men in the um, that fought with, alongside the British at the peak. The largest volunteer army, you know, in history, uh, in modern history anyway. Uh, two and a half million, that's just huge. It is, yeah. Now, people will not know this, but you're actually, by profession, a lawyer. Um, where did the interest in writing books and becoming an author come from? Well, I think it came from the fact that I didn't feel as though there were many contemporary novels out there that reflected um, my community, my, you know, the diaspora, the cultures, the, the religion, the heritage. I felt like there wasn't much out there about South Asians, Muslims, you know, um, our communities that I'd worked with, that I have um, you know, I've carried out charitable work, work with, and I feel like those themes, those stories, those characters were missing, and that's why I decided to start writing, because I just felt as though there was a gap there, and nobody else was doing it, so I, I just felt, you know, I just felt like I, it's something I really, it's not something I'd always wanted to do or anything like that, I just felt compelled to do it, especially as there have been quite a few, um, at that time, high-profile, um, so-called honour uh, case on abuse cases and things like that. And I just felt as though those themes, those issues, those aspects weren't accurately or weren't being reflected at all 
in um, contemporary literature in Britain. So that's that's kind of where the where the impetus came from. Yeah, and then you kind of become a writer. You write, and you've written two books already. Tell us a bit about them. Yeah, so I've got uh, two published novels. Um, Stained. Uh, Stained was published in two thousand sixteen in America. And I've got um, Rizia, which was published in 2019. Um, and one, the first one's set in Britain. It's about a young 18-year-old um, British Muslim uh, young woman who's facing some family difficulties. And um, it's how she navigates and the decisions she makes in her life um, to preserve the family honour. Uh, and it's quite an empowering message at the end, I'd say. And it has had a very large impact on a lot of women, especially who've read that book. And then Razia is about modern slavery and human trafficking, and it, it's quite an international story. It, it goes from London to Lahore to Islamabad to New York. So it, it's about a girl who's brought over from Pakistan as a modern-day slave, and it's about a lawyer in London who, who tries to rescue her. But in doing so, she actually makes things worse for her. And then Farah, the lawyer, has to go to Pakistan to try and help Razia out because she feels responsible. And, um, yeah, that story then, you know, covers all sorts of things like, you know, corruption and, uh, like I said, the issue of modern slavery and human trafficking is massive. Um, mod human trafficking is the third most lucrative illegal industry behind drugs and arms trafficking. It's, it's a huge problem. And modern slavery is a big problem in this country as well. So I just wanted to explore that topic of modern slavery and human trafficking, and I, and I just did it through... Uh, like the only way I know really is to, to, through storytelling. Mm. Because that storytelling and novel writing is actually based on reality. Because some of these yes. crimes that you talk about, forced marriages, rape, uh, yeah. honour killings, is yeah. sadly prevalent within our communities. Yeah, and in all communities really. Yeah. I mean, it, it is prevalent. And I think the problem is that, especially things like human trafficking and modern slavery, they're quite hidden by their very nature. So it's quite hard for people to have an accurate picture or even kind of any kind of realistic picture about what's actually going on out there. Um, they may even be in contact with modern day slaves, but they might not know it, you know? It might be something that they're just not aware of how to spot those signs when somebody is being kept as a modern day slave. And there's so, so many forms of slavery as well um, around the world, you know? And um, again, I think it, it is a massive problem but because it's so hidden by its nature. I think sometimes people either think it doesn't exist in Britain or they're just oblivious to it. So I, I just wanted to raise the profile of that issue. I think it is getting a bit more attention, but um, I think we've got some way to go, yeah. And when you, look, when you look at those stories and you look at the fact that there are lots of young Muslim women, Asian women, who might love to go into writing, and what, what's, what sort of lessons have you learned from your journey that they can apply to theirs? Um, lots of lessons. The, the publishing industry is not an easy industry to crack if you're from an ethnic minority, and the figures bear that out. So um, the industry says it's trying to improve things, improve the chances of ethnic minority writers. But I would still, it's still quite hard. However, that should never put you off, because I think if you love writing and you've got, you know, you've got a story to tell, you know, you, you, you'll you get that story out, however you do it. You know, I, I've had to work very hard, but, you know, it's it's a case of um, persistence and perseverance. I'll say if you're interested in writing and you have no experience at the moment, go to festivals, uh, sign up to your local writing agency. Every area has um, a writer development agency, and we here in the, in the West Midlands have Writing West Midlands, um, and every area will have one. So you know, join up with your local writing agency, writer development agency, and book on some courses and things like that. It's a, you know, it's a wonderful, uh, I love writing, I have to say, but it can be quite a lonely thing. So, uh, you know, it's when you have to write for long periods of time on your own, I, I you know, I think sometimes people are in love with that idea. They, they have people have this romantic image of, mm. of writers, and, and but it can be quite a lonely experience. I would just give that little caveat there. Um, I'm sorry, also, just, just checking here, you, you were the Nuri Nayat uh, Khan Muslim Woman of the Year Award in 2019. Wow. Thank you. Yes, I was. Yes. What was, what, I mean, what? Well, I, you know, that was, that was actually such a lovely award to get. Um, 
because um, that was just before the publication of Razia, and I think for, uh, I think that was the reason why I got the award. The fact that I was um, highlighting um, difficult issues. Uh, perhaps I was being bold about highlighting difficult issues, and I just thought it's amazing that the Muslim community had recognised me for dealing with difficult issues in Muslim communities, and I felt that that for that reason that you know that was an achievement because quite often there's this image that the Muslim support community doesn't support females who are a bit, mm. you know, um, outspoken or. Um, maybe that's not the right word, but, you know, uh, persistent in pursuing justice or fairness or equality or highlighting things that are wrong in society. Um, I I do lots of stuff that promotes our, our heritage, our religion, our culture. I, you know, I, I do lots of the projects. I'm, I'm also a creative projects producer and director, and I do lots of things that, um, lots of projects that do highlight that. But I'm also not, I don't shy away from difficult topics either. Yeah. So to get that award was, it was for me was personally really actually very rewarding. Okay, uh, the, the new novel, which is going to be based on the story of your beloved father, what when can we expect it to be released and uh, what are you looking well, forward to? Well, <laughs> I have to finish it first. So um, I'm hoping it will be finished by early next year, and then it, there's a bit of a process about a year or so before it's published. But I will definitely let you know, and I'm, I'm hope we'll be invited back on when it is published. I was just going to say. Um, I look forward to getting a copy. May you sign it as well? And I look you forward to we'll get having you back so we can talk about the book. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us and keeping the, the memory of your beloved father alive. Uh, I know that his story will have inspired so many people tonight. Thank you so much. That was Abda Khan, the writer, the novelist, uh, sharing her beautiful story about her beloved father, who served in World War II and was part of that generation, which is around 2 million people, 2 million people from India, which includes Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, uh, but also hundreds of thousands uh, from the colonies, as they were called uh, at that time, from Africa as well. And they were a generation who came, many in Europe, to fight uh, and to die uh, for the motherland, as it was known. Um, and as Abda was reflecting there, we as a country, uh, maybe sometimes in our history, forget that contribution. Because one of the lasting memories of history at school, when you, talked, when you were taught about World War II, that bit of the history wasn't in the curriculum. Um, and I hope that tonight we've been able to do justice to the topic. Right, when we uh, come back after the break, our final guest is going to be Lindsay Taylor. Uh, she's the region manager for MEN, the community organization, and we'll be reflecting as today is the last day of Islamophobia Awareness Month. The whole month is gone. Uh, we'll talk to her about her reflections, some of the events that have been happening, and how we can create a world free of Islamophobia and racism. Don't be going anywhere. Are you suffering from hair thinning or hair loss? Luxurious hair growth products use the highest quality natural ingredients and proven formulas for hair regrowth. Don't believe us? Then look at these results. Been using the hair serum and shampoo for about three months. Uh, my hair's quite a lot thicker. Uh, really recommend it. Get 10% off today using code BMTV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV. Before you get into that relationship, you need to be completely content with yourself. Areas in our, in our lives that need adjusting and that adjusting leads to healing. You using your emotional intelligence to understand other people. These are really tough topics, but really needed to be spoken about. Looking for the perfect place to host your next event? Gifto's Lahore Karai Banquet is here to make your event mesmerizing for you and for your guests. Catering for up to 180 people with extravagant ambience for all kinds of events like birthdays, weddings, henna, family function or anniversaries. Indulge your taste buds with authentic and freshly prepared Pakistani cuisine on site and delight your guests with elegance. For booking, contact Gifto's Lahore Karai. Over 100 years of expertise, 
Here at Kingswell Watch Solicitors, we cover a range of legal services, including immigration law, family law, and much more. Get in touch on 01924 461 236 or alternatively email us at inquiries at kingswellwatts.co.uk. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafiq. Now, let's move on to our final guest and topic. Now, November, as you know, has been Islamophobia Awareness Month. And throughout the month, we've been showcasing you a variety of community organizations that are making a difference to highlight the evil of Islamophobia and how it can be eradicated. Now, across the country, there's been hundreds of sessions, virtual and face-to-face, -face, uh, where people have had a chance to learn and understand more about why it happens and how it can be eradicated. Mosques have opened their doors. Islamic organizations have done that as well, and, and really a campaign from a grassroots to build a movement that we can eradicate, not just Islamophobia, but anti-Semitism and racism from our societies. Now, MEND is a not-for-profit company that helps to empower and encourage British Muslims within local communities to become more actively involved in British media and politics. Now, during this month, they've been putting on events celebrating the diversity of the community and how we need to confront and expose this evil. Lindsay Taylor is the regional manager who's based in Glasgow, and she's working to share her lived experience and those of others so we can work towards a world free of Islamophobia. Uh, she's just returned from the Scottish Parliament where she spent the day uh, promoting Islamophobia Awareness Month. I'm pleased to say she's back home safely in Glasgow and she's joining us live here on British Muslim TV. Lindsay, Salaam Alaikum. Well, welcome to the program. Great to have this conversation. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here this evening. Now, you've been hobnobbing, you've been having, I don't know, have you had coffee and, you know, what, what else have the Scottish Parliament offered you today? Oh, do you know, they offered us lunch and everything. It was wow. brilliant. So, yeah, there was lots of, lots of entertainment, which was really great. Yeah. And how's the month been? Because I was just reflecting, we were reflecting during the break there, that it's just flown by, but yours has been really, really busy. Yeah, do you know, it has been an absolutely mobbed month. It has been really, really busy. It's been crazy, but the atmosphere around it has been really fabulous. A lot of people would probably think doing a month around Islamophobia, obviously it's a really serious topic. Um, so a lot of people would think, oh, you know, that would be a bit serious. It would be quite difficult. But actually, yes, it does have difficulties. It is a really hard time, but at the same time, it's a really great month. There's a really amazing atmosphere within within MEND and within wider organisations who are engaging with Islamophobia, who are engaging with the topic and actively working to, to bring Islamophobia to an end. So actually there's some real positivity around it. And today when we're in Parliament, you know, uh, the MSPs were holding up the, the I am boards, uh, the selfie boards and saying, it's okay to smile. And we were like, yeah, of course, please do. And so, yeah, it's been really, it's been busy. It's been tiring, but it's been really positive. And what's the reaction been from the politicians? Because often politicians get criticised uh, for not addressing Islamophobia. But the situation in Scotland is somewhat different to say Westminster and local authorities across the country. What's the experience been like for British Muslims or Scottish Muslims engaging with their politicians at the Scottish Parliament? You know, it's been really positive, actually. Uh, we've had a lot of great engagement. We kicked off the month with um, Pam Gossel, MSP, from the Conservative Party passing uh, a motion in the Scottish Parliament for Islamophobia Awareness Month to be marked and for the people who are engaging with it and all the hard work they do to be recognised, which was really positive. We then did um, lots of different activities throughout the month where we've had MSPs sending in videos, um, highlighting the need for engagement. I know that there's been lots of activities happening um, on ISOCs in, in universities and things, and they've also been engaging with MSPs, which is great. And then obviously um, we were hosted today at the Scottish Parliament um, and we were hosted today by Paul Sweeney, a Labour MSP, who actually used to be an MP down in Westminster. And um, he brought us in to do a, a kind of open discussion, drop-in session. And we had representatives from all different party um, parties up here in Scotland dropping in, showing their support and really engaging with, we had the Islamophobia exhibition, really engaging with the exhibition, engaging with 
the volunteers who were there talking about Islamophobia Awareness Month. So generally, it's yeah, it is quite a different political landscape here in Scotland. It is much easier to engage with our politicians, especially over things like Islamophobia Awareness Month. One of the other positive things is obviously um, MEND has been doing a campaign called um, Adopt a Definition, and that's adopting de the APPG definition on Islamophobia. And the SNP earlier this month, uh, sorry, last month, this month's flown by, oh. um, but last month at their um, 2022 conference passed a motion for the Scottish government to adopt the definition. So that shows you how different the landscape is here in Scotland, um, which was really positive. So hopefully we'll be the first um, government in the UK to adopt the definition. Yeah, that's pretty fa 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 fascinating debate, the debate that's going on across the country around that definition from the British, uh, the all-party parliamentary group uh, for British Muslims and their definition. Obviously, uh, number 10 have said that they uh, are still doing some work on that, so we'll keep an eye on that as we go ahead. Um, how have men covered uh, Islamophobia Awareness Month across the country? So MEND has done loads of work during Islamophobia Awareness Month, and a lot of that has been outreach work. So doing a lot of partnership um, events and doing a lot of partnership work with organisations the length and the breadth of, of the UK. Uh, we've worked with organisations up in Aberdeen all the way down to um, right down to the to Devon and, and so forth. So there has been great engagement and it has taken lots of different forms. So I know that down in Birmingham recently they had um, one of their walking groups did uh, did a, a walk up a, a big hill and then did a, an I am banner at the top of that, which was great, and there were speeches and, and so on. We've had football matches um, tackling Islamophobia. And actually, one of the comments that were made by an individual there was, it's really nice to be on the pitch because it was two um, football teams who were based actually in Glasgow, Glasgow Ansar, um, and also Burnhill FC, and Glasgow Ansar is mainly a South Asian football um, team and Burnhill FC is mainly refugee and asylum seekers. And one of them said to me, it was really nice to be able to just play football. There was no racism, there was no Islamophobia, there was no, there was no issues. We were just there as two teams playing football. And that really hit home to me, the fact that individuals, even in their leisure time, even when they are just trying to kick a ball about, are actually facing Islamophobia and prejudice. Um, and it was really great to be able to come together to look at that. But there's also been loads of training sessions. I know that we've engaged with police, with local councils, uh, with mosques. There was obviously the, the National Hoopa Day um, on the 11th and loads of mosques up and down the country as well. Um, did the Friday sermon on Islamophobia awareness, which is really important. So, so many different forms of engagement have taken place throughout the whole of Islamophobia Awareness Month by MEND in, in many, many different ways. You know, and the, I mean, Lindsay, I was just reflecting on this. For me, Islamophobia uh, Awareness Month is around, there's two, there's an external sort of looking to the non-Muslim community, pol politicians, policy makers and community. And then there's that inward activity for within the Muslim community. What has the feedback been from within the Muslim community? The feedback's been really positive um, so far around Islamophobia Awareness Month and around engaging with that, especially as Islamophobia Awareness Month is not just about raising awareness of Islamophobia, which obviously is, is a big part of it, but it's also about highlighting the positive contributions of Muslims here in the UK. And I think that really helps the Muslim community to engage as well, because they see things like, I know that in your, your previous guest, you were talking about the, the world wars, and it's about highlighting things like this that many within our communities aren't aware of and don't realise that, you know, that many, many Muslim soldiers fought with the Allies in the First and Second World War. And it's about highlighting these contributions. It's about highlighting the amazing work that uh, Muslim communities have done through COVID. Um, so actually being able to highlight that and celebrate that and see young people, especially young Muslims. Um, I did a, a training course or I did a session um, in a mosque just at the weekend there. And we talked about the, the positive contributions to the First and Second World War. And many in the room were going, wow, we had no idea. And these were young Muslims who were like, oh, wow, actually that's that's a part of history that we can now say that we're engaged with. And um, there were others in the room actually, and it was really nice to hear that a couple of the others 
um, their school has actually highlighted that and talks about it. Uh, talks about it when they were talking about the first and second world war. But it's about making those connections for young people and for Muslims to be able to go. Wow, that's great. We we do have a history here in the UK which we can see and understand and interact with, which is really positive. Yeah, and I, I suppose the reaction. We've got about three minutes before the break, but I just wanted to pick this up point. The reality for young Muslim women uh, is that Islamophobia is still a real threat. They're, they have the headscarf ripped off, they get abused and harassed, not just uh, physically, but also on social media. Ha have we made much progress in, in trying to eradicate that threat? You know, unfortunately, Islamophobia is still faced by many. Uh, obviously, um, it is there is a gender aspect of Islamophobia, which is which is awful, and it does often uh, it is often faced then by women. But Islamophobia can affect all of us in all different ways, and we like to think and we do hope that by the engagement through Islamophobia Awareness Month and through the allyship that that can bring about, that actually we are making a real difference. You know, hate crime, unfortunately, is still there and it's still real, but it's about drawing attention to that. It's about drawing attention to the police forces that actually when they're dealing with a report of Islamophobia, that they need to handle it and support the victim in, in specific ways. They need to highlight the fact that it has been an Islamophobic attack um, so that actually the perpetrators can be um, brought to justice for those aggravations of, um, of the attack. But yeah, unfortunately, Islamophobia is still real. And it still happens on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's about us all working together in order to bring an end to, to Islamophobia. I mean, just sorry, I don't know how long we've got, but I just wanted to... Uh, OK, so we've got uh, about 30 seconds. Let me just ask you finally, um, how, how did you find that football element of tackling Islamophobia? That must have been somewhat different in Scotland. So how do you find the, the, the element of... Sorry, say that again? Sorry, I, I missed that last little bit. I, I was just talking about the fact, you, you mentioned earlier on about the football clubs also getting involved. How, how's that reaction been? Oh, it's been really positive because obviously there is a massive issue of Islamophobia and racism in sports. Um, so having that kind of interaction, especially with the football, was really positive. And actually community members came along to watch and support the teams. And it was really great to see that positivity but on the other hand, yes, there was a lot of supporters, but they were mainly support families and, and friends and so on. So having wider community supporters is definitely essential. And it's definitely essential that the wider communities realise the level of Islamophobia and racism within sports and so that we can really start tackling it together. Yeah, and we, we, we do often see across Europe, it's a lot worse in France and in other parts of the, uh, the continent. We'll talk about that as well. And your reflections about how we can do that. We'll take a very quick break when we come back. Our final break, where did the time go? We'll be back very shortly and continue the important conversation with the one and only Lindsay Taylor from MEND who's joining us from Glasgow. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Single Muslim Live here on British Muslim TV. Before you get into that relationship, you need to be completely content with yourself. Areas in our, in our lives that need adjusting and that adjusting leads to healing. You using your emotional intelligence to understand other people. These are really tough topics but really needed to be spoken about. When I joined SingleMuslim.com I honestly wouldn't have dreamt that I would meet someone that I would marry and fall in love with. With my free membership, I was able to browse through thousands of single Muslim women in my area and read their profiles. So thank you SingleMuslim.com for helping me complete my faith. Alhamdulillah, I found the one. Thank you so much SingleMuslim.com for making this happen. मुझे नालों वासा की नाले आज गोठ में रहता हूँ बरसात बहुत ज़्यादा पाई घर बुड़ी या बच्चा वटी भगा से सिर्फ बच्चा ही भगा से कुछ न बच्चों जायूं क्रीपियों कच्चों हूँ पेट ढवला है तासिक काऊं मानी करें अच्छे थी करें न थी अच्छे करें खाएं ता बच्चा करें न था खाएं लट्टा ने बिना खानी भगा हूँ पेरे उखाड़ा ह 
बस तरतबा थी वा खटा भी कान ने कुछ भी कान है बेवाया थी ने लगता हूं घर खाऊं असा के इधारे वारन दाल दिनी चावर दिनो गेहु दिनो खंड चाय दिनो साबुन तेल नाताओ पेस्ट यूनियन तो बच्चड़न जा तोलिया दिनाताओ जे के तड़कराए असा साफ करे वेहायो बच्चा असा के हर चीज इधारे वारन दिनी आला असा उनन के वधाई दो गेहु दिनाताओ हर चीज दिनी तो असा के Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're in the final segment. Wow, where did the time go? My special guest this evening is Lindsay Taylor from the community organisation MEND. She's their regional uh, manager based up in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, Lindsay, we, we've got a question uh, coming through on uh, social media from Ahmed who says that, um, you know, as, as, as bad as sometimes the narrative is here that Islamophobia is really, really bad in this country, Go and spend some time in France, uh, where anti-Muslim policies have been implemented, and a more draconian policy in Poland, for example, and uh, other parts of Europe. What's your view about that, and what's your reaction to what Ahmed is saying? I mean, definitely there are some pretty uh, harsh legislations coming in across Europe, and it is really concerning to see the narrative that's definitely coming through um, through there and and that's the thing when we're looking at Islamophobia in, in the UK what we are working to do is make sure that we don't have some of the issues that are arising in other countries and um, such as France where they're having the headscarf ban and really at the end of the day that's about taking away women's autonomy to make choices over what they are wearing and, and what they are doing with their own body and that's that's really important and I as as many of you may know or may not know I I'm a revert to Islam and I have been to France as a non-Muslim and I've also been to France as a, a hijab um, wearing Muslim and it is very different so yes I think it is uh, definitely a massive issue in in Europe when you think about what is happening um, what's happening to Muslims in their everyday life um, and trying to deal with the pressures of, of the Islamophobia there. Yeah, and that um, element of... I, 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 and it's not about belittling some of the... I mean, I suppose Ahmed is saying this. Um, uh, I, I think Halima is just somebody who else is saying, you know, that she can walk down the street here and quite safely wear her hijab, whereas in France or Poland and other countries, she wouldn't be able to do that. No, alhamdulillah, we are very fortunate in some areas. That are, are, we, are we too negative sometimes, so focusing on instances of Islamophobia rather than the positive experiences people have in this country? I think that's the thing. I think we have to look at both. I think we have to, you know, definitely highlight the fact that, you know, things like the Scottish government bringing in, you know, the 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 definition of Islamophobia and supporting that. I think we definitely need to call out the positivities here in the UK, that is essential, just like we need to call out the positive contributions of Muslims in the UK as well. But we also need to highlight the fact that as a Muslim woman, as you've said, we are, you know, under a lot of, um, we're more likely to suffer an Islamophobic attack. I myself, and I know that many people out there as well, have also suffered Islamophobic attacks out in the street. And yes, in many places it is safe for Muslim women and, and anybody to walk down the street and be safe and feel safe. But unfortunately, there's also lots of other areas where that's not the case. It's also a massive issue when we consider that simply by having a Muslim sounding name, you're three times less likely to be called for an interview. So that's before you've even got the foot in the door. Simply at the recruitment process, you're three times less likely to be able to be called for interview. So Islamophobia is not just a street based um abuse and, and violence that's happening, it's also the institutionalized issues which are massive. And that's something that we've also got to consider. So yes, there are many positives and there are many things that are happening in order to try and make our streets and, and, and so on and our community safer and more inclusive. But there are still many, many issues here that we do need to address. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, we do not want to get to the situation where we are in other countries when it comes to Islamophobia. We want to actually make sure that our country becomes safer for individuals, no matter what their race or ethnicity or, or gender is. And, and, and that's really important that we need to make sure that our country and that our 
spaces are safe for individuals. There was a report done by the Scottish Government a couple of years ago, and it showed that 60% of Muslims in Scotland were felt afraid simply leaving their home. It showed that 83.4% of all Muslims in Scotland had faced Islamophobia. And I know that there's similar statistics down in England and Wales. And so, yes, we do need to call out the positives and we do need to highlight, like today, being in Scottish Parliament. And that was a real positive and that was really, you know, inclusive place where MSPs from all different parties were coming together to talk about Islamophobia and say that we support, you know, Islamophobia Awareness Month and we want to work together to tackle this issue. So, yeah, we definitely need to call that out and celebrate that. But we also need to look at the reality of what it's like being in the street, being in the job market, trying to access any kind of services and the level of institutionalised Islamophobia within our systems. Obviously, we've just seen police and fire services coming out recently with reports showing and showcasing the level of Islamophobia and racism and misogyny within these organisations. So that's something, again, that we really need to tackle. So, yeah, there's plenty to be celebrating. But there's still a lot of issues that we need to look at as well. And, and when you say with some of those issues that we need to have a look at, what are the cures to stop Islamophobia? So a lot of the cures are things like this. It's about having the conversations, but it's about having conversations here, but also having the conversations within organisations. So I know recently uh, we've had lots of sessions with the police, both here in Scotland and in the rest of the UK. It's also about having sessions within our local councils. These are often the individuals on the ground who are implementing a lot of the work and making sure that a lot of different things are happening. And I know that a lot of the local councils across the whole of the UK have recently adopted the definition on Islamophobia, but in adopting that, a lot of them have gone that step further, further and said, actually, adoption is not enough. We need to make sure that there's training in place, that there's systems in place in order to protect our Muslim communities, but also make sure that our staff are trained and knowledgeable in the area so that they can call out and prevent Islamophobia as well. Also making sure that there's training within our schools, because Islamophobia is not something which anyone is born with. Any kind of prejudice or, or hate is not something that an individual is born with. It's something that's taught, unfortunately, through our society, through our media, through our politics. These kind of things are all taught and learned. So if we can learn to hate, then actually we can learn to not hate. So having a really good, robust education system that talks about inclusion and equality and all these things from the very beginning, we're talking about preschool, not just school or high school or a couple of classes here and there, we're talking about it being throughout the whole system is really important so that actually everybody can grow up and go into the job market without having these unconscious and conscious bias. And we're not going to have these issues where you're three times less likely to be called for an interview simply because you have a Muslim sounding name, because the individuals going into the job market, the individuals who are going to be the managers and the recruiters in the future, will have already had the education about you know, the need for everyone to be equal and treated the same and everybody to be treated uh, properly. Yeah. Um, MEND uh, launched recently the Nurturing Muslim Identities campaign. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, definitely. This is an excellent campaign and it's about engaging with schools. So unfortunately, there's still a lot of schools in the UK that don't have access to prayer spaces. They don't have access to halal meals for Muslim students and, and obviously prayer spaces for all students also. Quite often in schools, what we're seeing is that there's issues around uh, people being able to, or pupils being able to wear Islamic dress. So nurturing Muslim identities is about making sure that schools are safe spaces for children in order to be able to, to practice their, their religion in a really positive and inclusive way. And whether that's engaging with parents groups or pupils or schools themselves, about making sure that these facilities are available for our pupils and for for our children and also about talking about Ramadan and Eid in school as well. So there's a whole um, there's a whole list of resources there on uh, MEN's website um, that can be accessed, www.mens.org.uk. It can be accessed there. There's a whole bunch of different resources from Easy Read Guides um, about prayer spaces, Easy Read Guides about halal, um, halal food and so on. It's all there on the website and that's really easy to interact with. And obviously MEN's is there to support, but it's really great and easy um, information that actually parents and parents groups and pupils and teachers can take away themselves and start implementing themselves as well.
Yeah, that's been good. And, you know, one of the questions that often um, I get asked when I'm out on the road talking to people and um, doing events is how can we protect our children's Muslim identity in such turbulent times? Like, for example, in France where, you know, there seems to be a war against Muslim women and how they dress as it is in other parts of the country. How can we protect our identity in, in such turbulent times? Education, again, education is absolutely paramount to protecting um, Muslim identities and protecting our children. Engaging in things like nurturing Muslim identities is really important as well to make sure that when our children are going to school, actually they're able to pray when it comes to prayer time. Because what we're finding more and more is unfortunately many, especially young Muslims, are feeling that Islamophobia is their fault and they're finding that many young Muslims are not wanting to um, show their identity as a Muslim. I was watching a video um, yesterday, actually, I was doing a session with, a, with another member of staff and, and they showed a video of a four-year-old child and it's a four-year-old child's voice in the video and they're saying because they're being bullied at school and being told by other children that being a Muslim is bad and being a Muslim is wrong and the small child is saying, is it really wrong to be a Muslim? Am I really bad because I'm a Muslim? Because if that's the case, I don't want to be a Muslim. And to hear that out of a four-year-old child's voice is really devastating. So we need to make sure that our schools are safe spaces for children, that there's the education in place, that there are facilities in place for children and that it's normalised, that it's normal for a child to be able to go and pray and it's not made an issue of, that it's normal for a child who chooses, and that's the important thing, that the child chooses to wear hijab, that it's normal and accepted for this to happen and they're not bullied or made to feel bad by pupils or teachers and that's really important and that's one of the ways, one of the big ways that we can really help, you know, support our children in preserving their identities but also tackling the issues around Islamophobia so that they're not having to face this every time they walk out their front door. Final question, we've got about 30 seconds. Are you going to have a well-earned rest now that the tomorrow, the 1st of December, um, is World um, AIDS Day, but you'll, you'll have a good rest, won't you? Yeah, I, I, I'm hoping so. I've got quite a quiet day tomorrow, which is great, but we'll have a couple of wee bits to tie up, but then I do have a holiday booked, and I'm super excited for that okay. holiday. Anywhere nice? At my house. I'm just going to have holiday in my house oh, and nice. relax and take it easy for a, for a couple of weeks. It's, uh, you know what? The best time, I think, is that time where you can just switch off and stay at home with your loved ones. Thank you so much. I absolutely love it. Uh, spending time with you and uh, be my guest tonight. Best wishes uh, to you and the family and enjoy that holiday at home. Thank you so much. I will do. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my special guest there, uh, Lindsay Taylor. We've reached the end of the programme. Thank you so much to my guest and to all of you for watching. Uh, we'll be back next week again with uh, a similar show but with new guests and new topics. From me, Mohammed Shafiq and the team hall, thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>